so today I have a pleasure to introduce AJ White, who is brave enough to be our <laughs> lunch as a first year grad student. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you very much for doing that. Thanks. And uh, um, this is basically from what I found. It's your MA thesis uh, in geology. Yeah, that's right. My MS and, work. Yeah. Um, Cal State Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a um, friend who studied. Uh, <laughs> Chemical analysis of water at Cal State uh, <coughs> Long Beach. So I know that the university had a reputation of uh, doing um, um, really good scientific analysis. And it is my pleasure to introduce AJ's talk. It's titled Everybody Poops <laughs> Using Fiscal um, Fecal um, Stanols to Track Cahokia Region Population Change and Evaluate Ideas on Cahokia's Decline. So please welcome my day. Right. So uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'd like to start by apologizing um, because I know some of you brought your lunch and um, food is really kind of at odds with poop. So I'm sorry about that. I hope it's not too disgusting. But if you brought meat, you will be actively converting cholesterol to caprosinol, which is very much at the heart of this. So it's kind of participant learning maybe. I don't know, trying to spin it positively, but we'll just get right into it. Um, so um, as Jinko said, I'll be presenting um, what I did as part of my master's work um, in geology at Long Beach State, um, which is basically investing the use of fecal stanols in archaeology. So I'll first give you an introduction to these molecules, um, give an overview of uh, its use in our discipline, and finish with an application to Cahokia. So a good place to begin is just what are fecal stanols? Um, so this term refers to a suite of lipids that are produced in the guts of humans and several other animals um, that result from the microbial degradation of a parent sterile molecule. Now there are many different types of sterols. Um, the most recognized one is cholesterol. Um, so that's an animal sterile that's found in every uh, animal. Um, and when we eat cholesterol, which is what you see here um, to the right, the, um, the meat that contains that cholesterol gets broken down by microbes in our gut to the form of caprosinol. And that's something that doesn't happen in every animal. So dogs, for example, do not produce any caprosinol because their gut uh, biome is different enough from ours that they break it down a completely different way. Uh, so because of that and the fact that it's the most prevalent stanol in human feces, we use it as a human biomarker. And lastly, as is probably obvious by now, it's introduced into the environment as a form of uh, fecal waste. So that's why it's called uh, fecal stanols and why we had the poop emoji and all that uh, fun stuff. Um, so I'd like to now sort of take a look at uh, the pathway of these molecules out on a landscape. And so we discussed how uh, cholesterol gets converted to caprosinol in our guts and then gets introduced into the environment um, as a component of feces, but it can also happen just through the person actually dying. But since we all go to the bathroom a lot more than we die, really uh, feces uh, is the chief sort of mechanism for all of this. Uh, once out on the landscape, oh there, there it goes. Um, once out on the landscape, it can either be buried in situ or transported some distance to a basin like a lake. Uh, but once out in the soil itself, um, it will uh, persist for a very long period of time. And the reason is, is that um, it's a very unattractive molecule to microbes out in the environment. Um, the microbes in our gut already got the low-hanging fruit, the easy part of the molecule. And what's left is a very complex uh, molecule that's very difficult to break down, doesn't net a lot of energy, so it's ignored for hundreds to even thousands of years. It just sits there. Um, now eventually, though, they'll get desperate enough to convert it to the second derivative of cholesterol, which is called epicaprosinol. But we can find either of these molecules, and when we do, we can kind of link that back to a human presence on the landscape, possibly thousands of years um, before um, the present. So that's sort of the foundation of all of this. Um, so the use of fecal stanols in archaeology really began out of modern sewage studies. Um, and so caprosinol is used today um, as an indicator of sewage pollution in waters. Um, so it could mean that there's a leaking sewage pipe or something, and we send environmental scientists out to quantify it. Um, so the same um, laboratory applications were used um, by archaeologists starting in like the 80s and 90s, and it was originally used as sort of an indicator 
of a human presence on a landscape. So it was used to indicate the presence of agricultural fields um, that would have received manure, or the presence of things like uh, privies and cesspits, you know, areas where people were uh, actively defecating. But it wasn't until 2012 that D'Angelo et al. Um, made a publication that made a link between varying amounts of fecal stanols over time as a proxy of population change of humans. Um, and so when I first started my um, master's work in 2014, um, my advisor and I thought this was a really cool idea, but there wasn't that much follow-up work on this method to see um, really how viable it is in all sorts of places, what are its uh, advantages and limitations. So that's really what I wanted to set out and, and determine uh, through my master's work. Um, so a good place to begin is why would we use fecal stanols in the first place? What are the advantages of this method? Um, I believe that it can provide a more direct record of um, human population change because we're quantifying uh, molecules that actually originate in human beings themselves. Unlike some rather traditional methods in archaeological demography that rely on estimations such as the amount of rooms in a Puebloan room block or shells that a person would need to consume in a day, um, I think that this is one step closer actually to um, human beings themselves. Additionally, um, it has the advantage of not being very intrusive. You don't need to excavate an entire site to do this. You simply need um, small sediment samples that can be taken from a core. Um, so you, it really doesn't require a whole lot of uh, work out in the field. And lastly, uh, from that same sediment, you can do a lot of um, comparisons between other proxies, such as you know, paleo-environmental um, proxies on hydroclimate, things like that, and make direct comparisons between a population proxy and environmental events um, from the same core without having to really rely on a strong chronology. Um, so despite its advantages, there's really a lot of uh, considerations and even limitations um, that we need to be upfront about, um, about this method. So one of them, when we first started, was will this method work everywhere or did it just work because D'Angelo et al. did their study in the Arctic Circle, like way into North, uh, northern Norway, where it's really cold all the time and it would have made for enhanced preservation. So who knows if this method would work in a lot more uh, warm environments where there's more microbial activity. So we set out to test that by um, applying the method in a temperate climate. Um, this is Horseshoe Lake in Illinois, and we'll get into later what that means for Cahokia. And we also tested it um, in a tropical setting on Quan Lan Island in Vietnam. And so, unfortunately, we don't have a good chronology for, for Quan Lan yet, and so this is kind of on the back burner. But the point is, um, it worked in a tropical setting, in a temperate setting, and in an Arctic setting, in three very broad climatic regimes, which lead us to, to um, believe that this probably works anywhere and climate is not a major limitation. And I encourage you to go out and test that and you know, see if that's actually true. I think the more that we investigate this, um, the more sure we can be about that. A second consideration, uh, and one that turns out to be a major limitation of this method, is the fact that other animals, not all, but a, a select few, do produce um, fecal stanols, the ones that we're interested in, in a small amount, but one that still might be of significance. So um, here we see in blue, um, caprosinal levels for modern stool samples across various animals, including humans. And as we see and what we expect, humans produce by and large the most caprosinal, which is great. But um, at levels underneath about a tenth of what humans are making, but still some, we find animals like pigs, cows, even sheep, possum, and cats produce minor amounts of this molecule. So that makes the problem of how do we know that the area we're studying um, has a fecal stanol record dominated by a human presence, or maybe there's some lost city of pigs that is controlling all of this? And the answer to that is I cannot say with 100% certainty that it is completely human controlled. We need to make assumptions in this case and going forward. So what Dan Ju et al. did in their studies, they basically acknowledged that there were large domesticated animals present at their site in northern Norway, um, and they assumed that those animals would only be there because those humans were there as well. They brought them, and so that indirectly, that in indicates a human presence, that those animals represent that humans were there as well. Now, for um, our study in um, prehistoric North America, we had the advantage of not having these large uh, domesticated animals present. So we can simply just kind of X them out. 
However, I do concede that there were probably uh, populations of deer producing very, very small amounts of this because deer are herbivores, so they don't ingest a lot of cholesterol, but it still be, could be a little bit. Um, maybe an occasional bear that's contributing to this, but um, my assumption is that uh, we know that Cahokia's region supported um, thousands of people and that it's really people that are uh, controlling the uh, fecal stamen signature that we get. Uh, but again, I cannot actually scientifically prove that. It is an assumption and also a limitation of the study that I got to just be real about. Okay, so another consideration um, to discuss, and one that seems a lot easier than it actually is to figure out, is where did people poop? And it's a question that I don't think is answered enough, or at least asked enough in archaeology, um, because, um, yeah, I couldn't find a whole lot of information out there at all. It's almost like people didn't give a shit. Okay, there we go. Had to get the, the poo joke, the pun out of the way. Okay, so um, the answer is very easy to, um, to get to in a modern sense. So our poop all goes to very predictable places like treatment plants, um, assuming you lose a toilet. Um, but in a archeological sense, in areas that didn't have sewage, it's a lot more complicated. So I've been forced to kind of look at sort of anecdotes to kind of see um, how the, the range that people travel basically to poop from where they live. And there's a large range from what I found. So I was speaking to a, a German researcher who was looking at pile dwellings in Central Europe from the Neolithic. And she was telling me that they find coprolites right underneath the settlements themselves. So in that case, there's zero distance traveled. There's people, they literally wake up and they just do their business right off the side of their house. So in that case, that makes for a very easy study, and one that I actually might want to do one day. Um, you just sink your core in right there, you know where the site is, and it's wonderful, you're in the Alps, and it's a very easy time. However, outside of there, it's a little more complicated. So in perhaps a hunter-gatherer sort of perspective, I looked at some ethnographic research on the Hadza in Tanzania, um, and it was noted that um, people will defecate about 40 to 50 meters away from where their primary activity location and their sleeping area is, which is kind of a balance between the convenience of not having to walk too far, but also going some distance so that it's not very unpleasant. And so you get this diffuse kind of ring of uh, feces around the, uh, the site, if you will. Um, so under that context, you might want to sample close to where most of the artifacts are, but not too far at the same time to actually find the poop. Um, and then for Cahokia, I couldn't find any information at all about how Mississippian people uh, uh, defecated. Um, and so I looked to modern um, medical research of open defecation practices across the world, particularly in India, where there's a lot of work done on rural farmers. And it was found there that um, people will do most of their defecation out while they're working in the fields. So away from where they're spending time you know, in their settlement at night. And so in this case, it's actually quite a distance away from where you think the site might be. The poop is actually perhaps far removed from there. Um, so again, there's a whole range of where to look for when using this method. And you really have to think hard on where people would have used the bathroom because once you find that, then you can really begin the study. Um, by the way, if anyone in their uh, study areas throughout the world and times, uh, if you know any information about where your people went to the bathroom, please talk to me. Because I'm trying to really assemble more information, really compile this together, because um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, OK, so those are some of the major considerations I'd say need to be um, taken into account before going forward with this line of work. Um, and so now that we have that down, I'd like to show you an application of the method. Um, in this case, uh, at Horseshoe Lake, which is right outside of the, the massive side of Cahokia. So um, Cahokia is in southern Illinois, as I imagine most of you are aware, just across the Mississippi River from um, St. Louis. And um, here uh, is our study area sort of zoomed in. Um, this is the lake that we sampled, Horseshoe Lake. It's an oxbow of the Mississippi that separated about 3,000 years ago. Um, it's, it's rather nice. It's, it's a, a big, big large lake, but it's also very shallow. It's only a about a meter throughout its entire area, so you can stand up pretty much anywhere in here. Um, anyhow, uh, the reason that we sampled this lake is because right to the southeast, um, about 
I don't know, maybe a kilometer or so to the southeast is the site of Cahokia. And so uh, what we assume is that, as I just mentioned, um, you know, farmers were probably going some distance afoot to actually defecate. And so my hope is that um, the ring, if you will, of feces would be confined within, or mostly contained, by the watershed of the lake, which is shown by this dashed line. So the idea is, although we're getting trace amounts of it, it's hopefully is catching a pretty good representation of you know, different activities going on at Cahokia and washing in with time into Horseshoe Lake. So to do that, we got uh, two sediment cores from the lake. The first one I actually didn't obtain myself. It's from a, a study that was done by Sam Munoz and his colleagues. Um, and he published this in 2014 and 2015. So I got um, uh, easy sediment that was just sent to me. It had already been dated, so that wasn't a problem. But we wanted to make sure that the fecal stamel record that we we're getting here was representative of the entire watershed and not just the lake shore closest to the core. So I got a second core with the idea being that if those two cores agree in their fecal stanal record, then that's more likely to indicate that it's happening on a watershed scale and not something super local to that coring location. Um, now, a brief word on Cahokia. Again, I, I'm just going to assume that most people are very um, uh, well educated on uh, this site. Um, but just briefly, it is um, one of the most significant archaeological sites in this country. It's one of the largest mound building Mississippian sites. Um, a series of which were built up and down the Mississippi River Valley from about 1,000 to 1,400 AD. And um, uh, Koki is just particularly massive. It hosts the Monk's Mound, the largest prehistoric earthwork uh, on the continent. And um, without getting too much into its, its rich background and history, its demographic history is uh, of particular interest to me. Um, because what is generally um, agreed upon is that around the 10th century AD, um, Cahokia was a relatively small site. There was very few people there. But by the following century, it really exploded into um, an area, a, a city, that was bustling with thousands of people. Um, however, by the 1100s and into the 1200s, population was declined, and it's thought by the 14th century that this area was pretty much abandoned. So the reason why I wanted to target Cahokia as well for this study was because here is a site that has um, a very sort of sudden um, increase and decrease in its demography. And so if I want to see how well the fecal stanol method works, I can see how precise it is and how able it is, uh, it's able to pick up sudden demographic events. And in addition to that, I would be able to check the method against um, pretty well-established um, archaeological um, uh, population reconstructions with the idea that if we get a similar pattern, then this method probably works. Um, so this is also the first application of this method in an, a, a very well-known archaeological context. Um, so in order to do all of this, I had to first go out and get that second core, which was really hard. <laughs> um, the, uh, we were using a Livingston hand core. And as you can see, like I'm just letting the big strong guy, Joe, do the work. <laughs> I'm just like, I, I could not get it in there, man. It's, uh, it was rough. And when we finally did get our core, we were so happy. But then the engine on our boat went out. And we had to like paddle just very pathetically, like about a half mile upwind. The sun went down. As you can see, it's quite dark. We're just holding a boat through a swamp at night, covered in mosquitoes. I lost my shoe. But we got, we got the sediment. And that's what science is all about. So um, anyway, once we had the sediment, we could go into the lab and, and really work it up. I won't go into much detail here. The basic. Um, Strategy for this is that we need to get the um, fecal stanols out of the sediment and into a solution. And we do that through solid to liquid extraction. We used um, a soxalate system. Um, but I'm hoping to hear you something a little more modern. Um, then we, we then derivatize the solution. Um, and we do that in order to make basically what's uh, a controlled chemical reaction that um, artificially makes caprostal and epicaprostal slightly different from each other. Um, because they are almost the exactly identical molecule in terms of their structure. It's very difficult for GCMS to distinguish between them. So that's why we have this derivatization step uh, to improve our detection uh, through gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And that uh, is what gives us um, our data. 
A brief word on the chronology um, before getting into this, just to state how we uh, attained uh, time here. Um, so the first core that I mentioned to you, that was um, obtained by uh, Sam Munoz. And he had uh, two publications out of this, actually three, one that doesn't pertain to this work uh, as much. Um, but here's his, um, his uh, chronology. It's based off of 10 radiocarbon dates. Um, and in his 2015 study, he noted that there were um, multiple significant flooding events. Um, and I was able to find the same flood events in my core, and they happened at a very similar depth. So we basically linked the cores in time through these flood events, and that's how we were able to apply the chronology to both cores. Um, moving on to actually looking at our results, um, here is the results of our fecal stainal um, analysis um, between the two cores. And the first thing I'd like to point out is that they are pretty much in agreement for uh, most of the time. And that leads me to believe that um, they are representative of the larger watershed and not just showing what's happening right at the shore next to where we got them. Uh, there is a slight divergence in the historic period. I've thought a lot about that, and I don't have a good answer for why that might be. However, since our focus is really um, much earlier than this, um, it, it's, it's a good thing that we have this agreement on a, in a fecal stainal maximum around 1000 AD and a fecal stainal minimum uh, just after 1400 AD. Um, now, I'd like to mention, you'll, you'll see here that I have the data presented as a ratio, and I haven't um, discussed how we present our data yet. The reason I do this is because if we were to show just the sheer concentration of these fecal stainals over time, it would look like a decay curve. Um, because although caprosinol is very uh, recalcitrant and it persists for a long time, um, it does decay, and so we get less and less of it, and it makes these really important distinctions that happened in the past muted. So to really emphasize that, we use this ratio. And what that ratio is, is a ratio suggested by a British researcher, Ian Bull, um, a ratio of the human fecal stanols, caprosinol and epicaprosinol, to those same stanols plus 5-alpha cholesterol. I haven't mentioned that molecule yet, but what it is, is the breakdown product of cholesterol that occurs in the environment, not in our guts. So that's something that's just consistently happening in the environment as cholesterol just decays out in the open. So what we have is basically a ratio of the human input versus what's happening out in the environment, with the idea being the higher the ratio is, the more sort of human input, and the lower that ratio, the lower input, the lower population. That's um, the idea that we're getting at with this ratio. So now to put um, our data to the test and see how well they do uh, against those population reconstructions, let's have a look at that. So um, here are the population reconstructions um, from uh, Pocata and Lapano and uh, Milner. And as you can see, in a gross sense, they agree. Um, we do get our population high slightly before those of the um, traditional uh, reconstructions. But once we're in decline, um, they're very much in agreement. And we actually extend our population um, record out a little bit further on either end. So we find that our actual population is uh, population minimum is past the sand prairie phase and actually around 1400 AD in a time period where this is actually not that well understood in the region. So we're kind of contributing, I'd like to argue, to um, that period. Um, in addition, I've been thinking a lot about um, why we have the high a little bit earlier. And I think it's because what we're showing here is what's happening on the entire watershed. So it's well known that prior to Cahokia really taking off, there was a lot of people in the region to begin with. So I, thinking, I think what we're seeing is that there's a lot of people on the, in the region that are coming together to produce this high that we see here that archaeologically kind of shows up a little bit later. Um, and then also, last thing to note on, on this is just that uh, it's, it's very obvious how there's a lot more people um, in the Cahokia region before Cahokia proper was really established then if you look at that net change afterwards, it really crashes. So this, this is a net loss, and it's a big one, I'd like to argue. Um, and then we can kind of uh, just more for fun at this point than anything, kind of um, look at the timing of various um, uh, cultural events in, in regard to what we see in the fecal stanols. Uh, something that I found interesting that I don't know a whole lot about, so I won't speak to it very much, is just uh, the timing of Mound 72 and the uh, associated uh, human sacrifice happened during our population maximum, um, which I think is kind of interesting. It might be interesting to look into that more. 
But this is just a sort of side idea I have right now I'd like to pursue a little bit more. What is quite important um, to understand is that right when we're in um, our decline, you'll see these P's that show up as these arrows, uh, which stand for palisades. There were a series of palisades that were constructed around Cahokia that are traditionally thought of to be as an indication that things were going bad at the site. And so we, sure enough, we find them right about when we're really starting to get into a decline, which makes sense. That really holds up um, and leads me to further believe that what we're seeing here is real human population. And uh, lastly to note, um, we actually have a population rebound, a modest one, um, before um, European contact with the DeSoto expedition in the 1540s occurred. So um, it's been said that you know, when Europeans arrived, this area was abandoned. But I, I'd like to say that actually um, this area was starting to receive more of a rebound. And there were, there's definitely people here. Um, definitely not Cahokia level. But there's some rebound going on. Um, OK, so, so far what I've ba basically done is just showed that here's this method, and it seems to work. But we haven't really contributed that much new information to our understanding of Cahokia. Uh, so what I attempted to do um, for sort of the last part of my thesis work was show how we can use these fecal stanols to assess ideas on demographic decline, or increase for that matter, um, but in particular in regards to environmental events. Um, because like we can see with the fecal stanols in soil, and sediment, um, sorry, Lisa, I'll, I'll think more closely about <laughs> which term I use there. Um, set lake, lake sediment, um, we can also see paleo environmental events in lake sediment as well and make direct comparisons. So that's what we'll attempt to do. So um, there are many ideas as to why that dramatic decline at Cochia happened. Um, many of them are societal explanations involving political collapse or economic problems. And I cannot directly address those through these data. Um, that's a problem that I actually hope to think more about now, about how to bridge that gap. Um, but what I can really get into, and by the way, I'm not trying to um, not acknowledge those. I very much think that they're real. Uh, it's just a problem of trying to make direct comparisons. Uh, where I can make those direct comparisons is with these environmental explanations. Um, there it is. So. Um, uh, of the environmental ex explanations that I've put forward, um, some of them uh, involve multi-decadal drought. There's also changes in seasonal precipitation, uh, massive flooding, and environmental degradation. And so my hypothesis on all of this is that if a certain environmental event had an impact on Cahokia's decline, it would occur stratigraphically at or near the peak fecal stainal concentration. And that, if that um, did have an impact, it could have perhaps then kicked off that decline. So what we can do is look to um, the stratigraphy to see where these events occur relative to our fecal seal data. Um, so that's what I hope to do. And uh, one last note on this, too, is a lot of these researchers have kind of formulated their arguments in terms of it was this in a, in a very not in a comprehensive sense. And what I'm hoping to do, too, is perhaps use these data to unite some of these ideas as well as opposed to saying, this one's wrong, this one's completely right. Um, so uh, let's start with flooding. And I apologize, I, I have like a big figure that goes down. It looks great on paper, but on PowerPoint, not so much. So I had to kind of cut it around. So just ignore that uh, brown color right there. Um, but uh, Munoz et al. Um, hypothesized that flood event 5, which they noted is this uh, increase in median grain size right here. Um, occurs, uh, oh, they, they hypothesized that this had a impact on uh, Kogi's population. It was a big, unexpected flood event, and there hadn't been any floods for several hundred years before that. Um, so what we find relative to the fecal stanols is we have this flood event immediately um, after the fecal stanol maximum. Now, it might seem like you know, there's a gap in time right here because it's this width compared to that width. But note that that's 20 centimeters that happened instantaneously. That was a single depositional event that occurred immediately after this, um, these uh, more elevated values here. So I believe that this actually supports um, Munoz et al.'s idea that this flood may have contributed to the problems um, that Kokia may have had. You know, we can't go out and prove that uh, causation, but I do think that it is a pretty strong 
uh, correlation. Moving on now to environmental degradation. Um, it's been suggested as well that perhaps um, people at Cahokia uh, deforested the region, which led to problems with um, erosion control, and that, that forced people to kind of just pack up and leave. So um, if uh, there was increased deforestation, we would expect there to be uh, increased watershed erosion, which would lead to a greater mineral content in our lake sediment. Um, and so what we actually see is that um, we find mineral content decreased during the fecal stanol um, population maximum. So it goes down. Um, and to me, that indicates that, um, uh, that the fecal stanol data do not support the idea of environmental degradation occurring based on these data. So um, we don't see a strong correlation there, in my opinion. Um, and in addition to that, uh, Munoz et al. in 2014 actually demonstrated that um, uh, a lot of uh, tree pollen really uh, declined um, much earlier, around 400 to 500 AD. So he argued that that deforestation occurred a thousand years almost before Cahokia um, was, uh, was, a, was a thing. Um, so moving on to the idea of multi-decadal drought. Um, this was uh, an idea put forward in particular by Benson et al. in 2007. Um, and he basically uh, found uh, evidence of a large-scale multi-year drought that occurred in the mid uh, part of the 12th century. Um, and so uh, although I could not use the same methods he used, which were based on tree ring data, um, I, I figured that we could use um, oxygen isotope data as a proxy for hydroclimate um, and make a direct comparison between um, those isotopes and our fecal stanol data. So that's what we did. And so we would expect that if there was a large scale drought, what would happen to the uh, oxygen isotopes is that these delta 18 values um, would become more um, positive. Um, so you'd expect um, these uh, isotope data here in orange to be more positive during a drought and more negative during wet conditions um, for a very large drought with a lot of evaporation. Um, but instead, what we find is that there's positive delta 18 during the stanol um, high and negative delta 18 during the low, which does not support Benson's idea. That's saying that there was a drought when most people were there and that things got wetter when people started to leave, which is kind of the opposite of what he suggested. Um, I do think, though, that Benson was definitely on the right track in the idea that hydroclimate and, and rainfall in particular played a big play, or was a big player in Cochia's decline. So um, sort of an amended um, theory on that was put forward by Bird et al. just this year. Um, and their data comes from Indiana. They're looking at delta 18 values of, of um, carbonate material from a lake um, over in Indiana. And um, they suggested that it's more of a changes in the seasonality of rainfall. And that what was happening was um, there were times of more summer season precipitation, which is great for maize agriculture. And then there are times where that precipitation shifted to more winter rainfall, which doesn't do that much for you in terms of maize agriculture, which would be you know, bad for people who really relied on that. So um, what we'd expect then is that there'd be a more positive delta 18 um, values during the warm season as we're getting um, like uh, positive delta 18 water coming up from the Gulf of Mexico and being dropped in the summer. And then we'd expect more negative delta 18 values during the cold season as we're getting more rainfall coming in from the north from water that um, is characteristically lower in its delta 18 values. Um, and that's exactly what we see. We see that during the fecal stanol high, here we have our relatively higher delta 18 values, which may indicate that during this time, there's more summer precipitation, good for growing maize, and then we lose that around uh, right here, and it shifts to a more negative value. So this could be a large change in climate controlling this. Um, and we actually find, too, that um, our delta 18 values uh, match up quite well with those of bird et al's. And you'll see that there's this area that's positive, an area that's positive, and then an area that's negative, and an area that's negative. And we find that in our lake that's much closer to Cochia. So I think this is definitely a regional phenomenon, not something specific to just the lake in Indiana. So to tie it all together, and I apologize because this is a very 
very tall graph, not good for uh, PowerPoint. But what I believe happened is that we have this change in seasonal precipitation, I believe occurred around 1150 AD, uh, right here. There was also this flood event that happened around the same time um, on our age model at 1159 AD. Um, and that kind of corresponds to this drop in stainals that happened right there. So it is my opinion that um, there was um, not just one large environmental event, but several environmental stresses. One affecting you know, agriculture in a sort of longer trend and one an immediate event in terms of a flood that might have put increased stresses on the people living here who may have already been dealing with economic and political problems on top of that. So in order to really get people to leave, if you have all these problems happening all at once, I think that really is a good case for what might have been going on. Um, and it's through the fecal sale data that allow us to do that, that allow us to really unite the flood and the changes in precipitation. Uh, it's because that's what kind of ties us all together. Um, and I'll even, since I feel this is a friendly environment, I'll, I'll take it a, a leap further. <laughs> um, so, and I was talking with Jinko in class about this other day, about the effect of climate. And so I'm going to show my true colors here. Uh, <laughs> so, so I also plotted um, North American um, temperature um, change over time here. And again, I'm sorry that I had to kind of cut this awkwardly. And what we see is that there's actually warmer um, medieval climate anomaly um, sort of level uh, temperatures earlier on, closer to Kokia's maximum population. And we do get this uh, kind of decrease in temperatures as we're transitioning to little ice age um, conditions. And I do wonder, I'm not going to say that this is what happened, but I wonder if that might have been manifesting itself in this you know, sudden increase in flooding and change in, in, in the seasonality of precipitation in the context of more almost global level climate change. Um, so that one I'm less a little bit ready to, to, to take and run with. But I do wonder if there's some sort of relationship here atop what's happening um, at a societal level. Again, which I wish I could talk more about. I just haven't found a way to, to make that jump yet. So um, that is what happened uh, at Kokia for my data, I think. Um, and in terms of new directions and, and uh, ways that I want to take it here at Cal, um, Lisa and I are looking at uh, trying to test this method in an epipaleolithic context from a burial, um, which as far as I can tell will probably be like the oldest this method has really been attempted. So that's kind of seeing how far back in time we can go. Additionally, in targeting a burial, I haven't heard of people doing that. So that's kind of a new direction for it as well. Um, I'm also really excited about using biogeochemistry in archaeology, and I'm going to keep an eye out for you know, other approaches that we can be using um, to, uh, to get at the past um, coming in this kind of way. And then also, I'm, uh, I'd really like to hear any sort of new ideas that anyone might have, or possibly even collaborations, or even just advice about you know, how this all works, what you think of it. And uh, again, if you have any information on where people pooed, uh, tell me. <laughs> No, um, so uh, yeah, so um, thank you very much for your uh, attention, and uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Right. Hey, Felicia. That's a good question. So uh, the, the movement of the molecules right in the sediment. Um, so I mean, we're, we're in like sediment. Um, and it's, at times, you do get these kind of big pulses, like those floods that might be kind of um, stopping some bioturbation. Um, at the same time, um, these molecules are hydrophobic. So they do want to latch on to the sediment that's near them. So I think that would probably prevent a lot of uh, movement. Um, but I have not really investigated what happens to these in soil with time. You know, do they stick in place or not? I, I frankly don't really know a whole lot about that. Yeah. But I think not too much. Yeah. yeah. How much would human diet affect this? Like, if you have a population that's yeah. largely like, eating tumors and, and very little protein, uh, and what if there were changes over time also in that? Uh, what effect might that have? 
That's a great question. So, like, you know, if, if you have someone eating more cholesterol, ingesting more cholesterol than, than others, um, I don't think that has been investigated formally. And I've considered maybe changing my diet <laughs> and trying this out <laughs> myself. Um, you know, um, and just like eating barbecue all the time versus, you know, going vegan. Um, because I think that, that might have an impact. I think there's an assumption that I make that the diet across time is pretty consistent, um, which is probably not the case. There's probably some changes, I think. Um, it might not make a, a huge difference, um, but that's yet to be investigated. Yeah. Yeah. You finished up by saying you were people are pooping. Um, and, and it made me think of you know, American colleagues who are uncomfortable with the facilities and some of the villages where I work in Southern Africa. And so they go off into the corn field. And then you know, later, you know, community members say, hey, the corn's growing really tall over there. <laughs> but uh, we have high school students doing hardware store soil tests in survey patterns across the valley or some of these communities that we work in. Would those tests help you narrow in or, or would there be a parallel test that you would run or suggest for us to run as we do these valley-wide surveys doing these hardware store, you know, just, you know, they're saying, oh, this is really, you know, really high, these kinds of nitrates are really high in these kinds of phosphates and we think they're growing these kinds of crops because of these surveys, would there be a parallel test that would be affordable and run and something that our high school kids could actually run um, that we could be doing to kind of answer your questions? Where do people poop or were they using that soils to fertilize? Yeah, that, I think that's an excellent um, idea um, that could be relatively done easily in the field. Um, the laboratory methods of, of quantifying this stuff um, can be more advanced um, and um, can be a little expensive as well. Um, for my master's work, each of those dots was $50. So um, that, yeah, it adds up. Um, so I'm not sure what you know, the price will be when I get that. I, I'd really like to you know, get a relationship with the lab here. Maybe it will be more uh, uh, cost effective. But that's just something to consider in terms of actually going for fecal snails. Now there, I, I am familiar with some work looking at, um, looking at like phosphorus and nitrogen and things like that, that's a lot cheaper to, to analyze for. Um, and that might give you a better idea on just fertilizer in general, not specific to a certain animal or human. Um, so yeah, but if you're looking for fertilizer in general, yeah, I might suggest what you kind of had mentioned for those, those elemental sort of studies. Yeah. I want to go back to Pat's question about the diet. Uh -huh. Sure, yeah. Um, I can only speak somewhat anecdotally to this since I, I really cannot consider myself an expert on Kogia. <laughs> I mean, that takes decades. Um, but what I can say is what I've read is that there's surprisingly not a large variation from what we can tell in um, what uh, people with, of more hierarchy um, were eating compared to the more average person. There's not seemingly a huge difference. There was feasting. Oh, yeah, do you want to jump in there? OK, so there you go. Um, as to how that might affect the data, um, given that you know, the lead are a relatively small group of people, as long as you know, we have something that is um, pretty consistent across a large group of people, I think that's what we need to really establish what's happening in large scale population. And you know, what, what a few people might be eating in a small difference, I don't think would make a huge impact on um, you know, our ability to distinguish large scale population change. Yeah? Um, wouldn't, uh, I would assume uh, dietary scholars, gut scholars, would have some sense about how these chemicals are made in the gut, right? And mm -hmm. so 
Uh, cholesterol is pretty obvious. We know what the plants and animals cholesterol occurs in, right? There's right. data on that. Um, your stanols are, are not necessarily coming only from cholesterol. I have to so, be so clear on that. Are they coming from other things besides, or is it all about cholesterol? Right. So, yeah, so what I did not get into today is that archaeologists also use other types of stanols um, that come from, from, from plant sterols. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're looking at, um, if you, like, so I mentioned that there's some domestic animals like cows that produce a molecule. Mm -hmm. Cows produce way more cytosterol, stigmasterol, because they're eating primarily plants. And so um, people can um, use those molecules for that study. However, for caprosinol, that does derive only from uh, cholesterol. And um, so, you know, cholesterol uh, produces caprosinol. And it can be degraded in various ways, but, but caprosinol itself only comes from the parent molecule of cholesterol. But cholesterol is, exists in more than meat. Right. I mean, we make it in our body. You can be a vegan, and there will still be some amount of caprosinol in your feces. Mm -hmm. A lot less, though, because you don't have that additional so input. You're using It, not so much a symbol of meat eating, just a symbol, a, a symbol of this is a molecule that's produced pretty uniquely in human guts. And that's what we're using to try to link but back to the human guts. Right. right. There's, uh, diet has not been investigated in a large sense in, in regard to this method. And there, there could be a lot of important differences there that, that might mm -hmm. matter. Um, but as of yet, I, I don't really know what they are. I think that's why the issue of different people within a population eating different foods mm -hmm. is minimized because he's actually looking at the presence of a population as a whole. Well, the whole uh, watershed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But then it also kind of raises the issue that with a little bit of refinement in the technique and the particular scandals that you mm -hmm. test for, you could actually get at questions of diet. Right. More like in your burials. I mean, the, a burial sure. is really different than a watershed. Right. <laughs> no. For sure. And exactly. And that will be. Mm -hmm. But uh, your core is still a lake core. Right. So does it have to be waterlogged, like pollen? Yeah. Preservation condition? Does it have to be waterlogged? No. Um, so the first studies were not in water. Um, they were just on dry land. It was someone going across a modern farm okay. and looking to see, has it always been a farm? Okay. And just getting soil. Um, uh, however, I think with the advantage of uh, some sort of catchment, such as a lake, is that you do get cast a wider net. Right, right. And so that's why we went for water, not for some sort of um, preservation reason, okay. was to catch that. And also because I think that lakes are great uh, records of other events mm -hmm. um, that make you able to say a lot of things about you know, climate and things like that. So um, when I think of uh, agricultural practice in Japan from the 16th century on, they actually utilized uh, human feces as fertilizer Oh, well. Wow. So they actually transported uh, Big Chang to outside of the city of Edo. And that was part of the reason why um, agriculture um, in the suburb worked very well. They also shipped a whole bunch of uh, uh, herring and sardine um, all the way from Hokkaido to uh, mainland. Hmm. So obviously, this requires a big boat. But in your <laughs> case, like, imagine if they were utilizing uh, feces as fertilizer to agriculture, um, that kind of thing could be potentially detected. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a wonderful study. And a similar study was done on Mycenaean farms in Greece mm -hmm. um, by uh, Ian Bull, who I'd mentioned earlier. And so he was looking at, um, you know, 3,000 year old farms mm -hmm. um, that had human feces mm -hmm. as the fertilizer. And I think for this case, it sounds like it might be more widespread and a more of an obvious change. You might be just in the soil profile, no caprosinol, caprosinol, and then bam, you know, a sudden pulse of it. So that, that actually might be really interesting to look at. Yeah.
Uh, yeah. One tiny little thing to say. Please. Um, I've been to the Lockerton Island. They are not cold all year round. They're very much affected by the Atlantic current. In fact, mm -hmm. they have full summer temperatures in the summer. So don't, you know, when you characterize it as being in an Arctic environment, cold all year round, that's not the case. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> very well. Which is even better for you because it's not frozen all the time. Right. Yeah. It's true. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a summer climate in the summer. Okay. At like 70 degrees north. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful island. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.